So from the world of gaming and entertainment to a world which is in some ways overlapping because I think identity overlaps with everything. Our conversation about identity has to do with, as I mentioned, everything from gaming and who we are and these sort of avatars we create to much more kind of pertinent social issues like contact tracing and how we validate to the government that we are not Corona carrying, right? So now we have an interesting conversation with Munib Ali. Munib is the CEO of Blockstack and a very wide ranging thinker. Uh, Munib, thanks so much for being here. Thank, thanks for having me. So uh, nominally, we'll start with identity. I'm sure that we'll go way off the beaten path, uh, but let's start uh, on the biggest level. I know you have to, you have to structurally think about this in in your work with Blockstack, but for someone who isn't used to thinking about identity as a discipline or as an entire area, how does identity uh, or the construction of identity play into our daily lives? Yeah, so I think uh, in a very broad sense, the way I think about it is. Um, our lives are becoming more and more dependent on the internet, right? Like imagine even during the virus crisis, everyone's kind of like sitting at home and realizing that they can do most of their work online. They can even like hang out with people uh, over Zoom or something like that. And, and I think one thing people haven't really realized is um, you don't have the same sense of uh, who you are or what kind of assets you own on the internet versus the physical world. Right. In the physical world, you will have your ID card in your wallet and you can like, pull it out whenever you need to. Or uh, you can you can own a house. You can um, kind of like keep all of your uh, belongings in it. And we haven't reached that level of maturity uh, in the digital world. And I think we're getting there. And that's where blockchains play a big role because they really introduce at a fundamental level uh, property rights. And I think you, you just had that uh, conversation with, with Kathleen about gaming and how gaming assets can be defined uh, uh, using blockchains. And I think you can make it even broader than that, like internet assets in general uh, would be defined through these blockchains and identity is a big part of it because you first need to kind of like define who you are before you start uh, owning other, other things online. Yes, yeah, so I think this idea, this property rights piece is, uh, it's interesting, the conversation around identity for, especially for folks who just start to think about it, it seems super abstract, right? It seems like this set of things that you haven't really thought about, but then they're also so intrinsic, so obvious, right? So you brought up the concept of property rights. And so the idea of a property right, like if you own something, well, who is the you that owns that thing? That's what the kind of identity mechanism is. That's what you were bringing up in the context of, of blockchains. Outside of gaming digital assets, what are the other types of uh, digital assets where those those property rights matter, and how does blockchain solve for that? Yeah, I think some some of these examples are like right in front of us, but we uh, it takes a little while to realize it. Uh, let's let's take Naval for example, right? Naval the the handle on Twitter. I mean, it's it's a, in some ways it's an internet property. It's very valuable. Uh, it might be worth a lot more than you know other distribution channels or even brands that exist on the internet, but right now, like it's basically just a entry in a database on Twitter somewhere. And it's it's entirely possible for someone like Naval or others to directly be owners of their own assets. And they are going, these such assets are going to become more and more important, even from an economic perspective, right? Like uh, more and more people are now uh, making a living online, right? So if you're, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, when people realized that they could rent out their um, their house on Airbnb and start making money off it, now convert that into uh, something digital. Like, let's say you have a skill online, or you have a reputation online, or you uh, or you're trying to monetize your attention, and all of these things will be linked back to your your identity and who you are. And those things, there would be like real dollar values on 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 some of these things because these are your real assets, right? The private keys that owns a username like Naval, there's a real dollar value uh, to that internet asset. 
Well, it's, so the Naval example is a really interesting one because we've come up in this paradigm where basically when Web2 came about, when social networks came about, we were kind of sharecroppers on someone else's digital property, right? We were allowed to accumulate audience on the basis of having interesting things to say or figuring out the rules of the system in terms of what was, you know, the algorithm was going to promote, but we al were allowed to use that, that, uh, that territory, right? The audience that we built so long as we continued to to play by that set of rules. And so long as the system or the the, the kind of the, the property holders didn't actually change what they wanted the system to be. This has led to issues around, uh, you know, or questions of deplatforming and all these sort of things where we realized that we were actually just kind of renting the space that we have. And the interesting paradigm shift that is, uh, I think the, the potential that gets a lot of folks in blockchain exciting is Naval has the followers that he has because they're uniquely interested in his insights. And, uh, and, and the, it would be a shame for all of a sudden, all those people, all of that energy to just dissipate into thin air because of a seemingly arbitrary decision on the part of the platform. What if you could design something different? Now, the way that I think most people have tackled that question right now, I, I think you see it in the shift to email, right? This radical shift to holding email lists, which can be easily exported to CSVs. But, you know, you've seen experiments, uh, I'm sure, on Blockstack and through other uh, other protocols. Do you think that it's possible that we actually have these kind of this different type of social networks, different types of social channels where you actually own the audience that you build, or at least the distribution channel to those audiences? Yeah, I think I think this is a, this is a very important point. Uh, anyone who is basically a content producer online, they realize the importance of distribution channels, right? I, th I think Twitter recently did a very small experiment where uh, they slowed down the distribution rate of tweets. That's, that's I think, my guess that that's what they did. So what would happen is that you're actually getting less impressions early on. And it, 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 fe it felt a little bit like, you know, someone has muted you, right? Like you, you might have like 50,000 followers, but only 500 people are... Uh, even seeing your message in the in the initial hours or so, and I think there was a reaction to it. And, and moments like these, they make you feel uh, as if like you have no control over your own content and your own distribution. And in in my case, like you know, I'm I'm I, I just like randomly blab on Twitter, or sometimes I, I post about Blockstack. But for some people, like that's their livelihood. Like they're uh, they're content creators on YouTube. Or you know they have these distribution channels where their their monthly uh, salary actually comes from those distribution channels, and if you cut them off, it's uh, it, it's a it's a very devastating situation for them. And I think that this is a fundamental issue where um, the we're moving more and more in the direction of like uh, digitized lives. Uh, more and more people are information workers, and at the same time, we're missing this fundamental layer of owning your own distribution channels, uh, basically having the, the, the similar structure to what exists in the physical world in many ways, it's not really there. I think the analogy would be that uh, we are all kind of like, you know, there, there's some uh, feudal lords and we all kind of like work for them. And at the, at the whim of someone, uh, they can take something away from us or kind of like uh, redistribute it somewhere else. And it makes everyone feel uneasy. So I think... People do have understanding of what the base problem is. They can feel it in their gut, but they don't see a practical, easy solution to any of these things, right? Because starting social networks or starting any any sort of a large movement is a, is a little bit of a network effect. Uh, I'm pretty sure that most people on crypto Twitter, they realize at a fundamental level, like what kind of uh, problems we're talking about, but we haven't seen a crypto Twitter emerge because everyone just wants to be where everybody else is. And I think somehow uh, there, there could be some clever hacks around uh, these initial network effects problems. Like, for example, you could potentially just extend the Twitter protocol in a decentralized way. So you can like bootstrap the existing system uh, to be able, able to launch something else. And I think there, are, there might be some inter interesting experiments, uh, even on top of Blockstack, that we might see in the, in the coming months. 
Yeah, it's interesting. The first wave of answers to this problem, I think, theorized that you could use tokens to overcome that initial period, right? The bootstrap problem. I mean, this is what Chris Dixon was writing about in 2017. And it turns out problematically that tokens were so good at being a uh, a financial asset that it it's not even necessarily that they wouldn't have done that as well, but they were so tradable, so instantly liquid, so powerful in that context that it kind of subsumed that other uh, bootstrapping probability or possibility. Um, I, Maybe just to, to kind of wrap up, how do you think has COVID-19 impacted how we think about these problems, how we think about identity? Do you think, you know, either on the side of there's going to be new things included into our identity profiles, such as, you know, test results from uh, from COVID-19 tests as we want to enter buildings, or on the other hand, just an awareness of the problems of, you know, that maybe in certain cases we're the frogs in the, in the pot with boiling water when it relates to how much information we share about ourselves? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll separate the two. One is more about the virus crisis itself. And I think my, my worry here is that um, if you look at history, a lot of times it's the times of crisis where certain um, kind of like fundamental rights are taken away from people uh, never to really come back, right? And this might be one of those things where, you know, if, uh, if governments want to really track uh, all of the citizens and even like large tech companies are stepping up to help them. And it becomes very hard to argue against that. Hey, wait a minute. What about my privacy? Right? Like, like it's a, it becomes a very tricky argument, but once you go down that road and once those systems are in place where, you know, there is uh, full on surveillance happening it, initially for good intentions. Uh, I worry a lot that if you're not thoughtful about these, some of these solutions, the same systems can later on be used uh, to basically build uh, a surveillance state almost uh, around uh, around the citizens and take away some of our freedoms, right? But it's a it's a very tricky topic. So my my hope here really is that we can be thoughtful about the kind of uh, solutions that are being implemented, especially around because there could be like all sorts of uh, burner IDs, right? Like I'm willing to share certain information about myself over a certain time period without really attaching it to who I am. And also like, instead of uh, coming up with these large data sets that are sitting with a large tech company or a, or a large government, uh, it could be something where this data is actually distributed and it mostly stays with the users and is used more on an as needed basis. And I think the time to think about those solutions is, uh, is, is kind of like now. And on the other side, I think what you're uh, asking is, I guess, more on the what's the impact on society, given that everyone has been forced to stay at home and just interact with the, the rest of the world through computers. I do think that it's a fundamental shift because it's a cultural shift, right? And I think cultural shifts are uh, the hardest, but once they happen, it basically, it just unlocks a, a new type of behavior and a new type of thinking. And it, it will remain, it will make a permanent mark in my view, right? For example, like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tech geek, right? I, I spend so much time in front of computers anyway, but during COVID, I'm actually for the first time paying attention to what my home setup is like. Should I get like, you know, uh, a better recording equipment or how much time am I actually spending online and what, uh, what kind of uh, different distribution channels are there? for even getting uh, some of the educational information about Blockstack or other places out. And I don't think it really hit that hard uh, earlier when we were mostly in the mindset of like, hey, we are going to office and we are kind of like uh, putting our head, heads down and, and doing work that way. Yeah, I, I think that conscientiousness and uh, understanding the context that we operate in is hopefully something that's rising right now. So Muneeb, thank you so much for sharing your insights today. Really appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Always happy to be part of Consensus. Thanks, Muneeb. All right.